Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 278 of Constructed Criticism. I am your host this week, Mason, and I'm joined by my fellow host, Spencer Halland, and my other host, Trey McLarnon. What up, everybody? If you did notice, Mason did say episode 278, and if you're wondering why you think you missed a week, it's because Mason put the wrong episode number in last week. Hmm. It sounds like Spencer knew I put the wrong episode number in, <laughs> didn't change it, then put it in the show notes, but who knows? It's all up in the air. That's all hypothetical. <laughs> I approve uh, of saving attacks until we're recording. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, everything. I didn't. I didn't hear anything about this until literally right now. It's been an yeah, actual I've been, week. <laughs> I've been waiting all day for this. <laughs> I'm so sorry. How was it? Was it everything you dreamed it would be? Yeah, it was pretty great because you were pretty shocked. Yeah, it happens. A little behind the scenes, there was no discussion about this in the chat. We didn't talk about this ahead of time. This has been. This dagger has been saved and delivered to you, the listeners, by Spencer Holland. <laughs> It was so worth. I didn't even change it in the feed. Oh my goodness. Uh, it was a lost episode. Life is, life is great, man. Life is great. Spencer, you know what else is great? Our new Patreon. Do you want to talk about that real quick? Yeah. So as promised, we have updated our Patreon. You can support us, the creator, at patreon.com slash ccmtg. And Patreon is kind of the way to give back to the creators in your life. So if, if you like a podcast uh, or if you like a YouTube channel or uh, an artist or things like that, Patreon is a way to give back to those people. And so we, we kind, of, kind of talk about it every week, but we uh, when we joined together to do the show um, the last couple weeks – we knew between the three of us that we really wanted to update the Patreon and give it uh, kind of a facelift and represent the things that we thought it should do. And one of the things that we thought it should do is really deliver the value that you're paying. And so we have new tiers. The goals aren't in there yet. There's something we still need to discuss. We need to figure out stuff for a couple of goals. So for example, t-shirts, play mats, stuff like that. I think we've probably already met a goal that would happen for tokens. I just need to look into the price of those. So that might not be a goal. It's possible that we have to update something like that. Um, but I think that for me, my favorite part about this is, is lowering the dollar amount for the Facebook group. So, um, and it's so funny. Everybody always talks about, you know, how many they miss the old, uh, constructed criticism Facebook group. It was like the best community in Magic for them. And if you love that community, if you're a patron of five dollars or more, we do still have a Facebook group for our constructed uh, critics, um, which is that five dollar level. So head on over to Patreon.com/slash/cmtg. We've lowered the amount from twelve dollars to five dollars. And the real reason for this is because, you know, I I think that it's important to have access to this because you will have access to the other people who believe in what this show stands for, right? That always improving mentality, trying to get better. And so in order to give the most to those people, we thought that it should be easy for them to interact with each other in the, you know, in the easiest medium on the internet right now, which is Facebook. Yeah. I hate discord. So, so I'm down for this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm after discord. Me and discord got a beef. So I'm yeah, I, I, I do. I do love our public discord. Um, there are weeks where our public discord is super hopping and weeks where it's a little quiet like this week, but I, I'm a fan of the discord, but the Facebook group is always hopping. I think there's, you know, multiple posts in there every day, people talking about decks. I know uh, Andrew, uh, one of the listeners of our podcast, uh, posted a deck that he was considering playing. And, you know, one of the things that a manager at a job I once had taught me is that sometimes it's not about having all of the answers yourself but knowing where to find them and i immediately went and reached out to somebody that i know who had played this deck at, a, at, at an event and gave andrew notes from that player and that's the kind of discourse that i really am excited about for this group is just this uh you know this this greater community to build and, and be a part of and you know go to patreon.com slash ccmpg pledge five bucks a month and uh, you'll have access to that group so. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. We also have other cool things like we're taking some of the stuff we used to do on even odds, and we're bringing it here to constructive criticism. So, like, if you're a patron of five dollars or more, you also get the Patreon calling question. So, like a normal show that would have a Patreon question, we do things a little bit more razzle dazzly here, <laughs> and you're actually be on the show. So, we're gonna have a Google voicemail set up. You'll call in, leave about a minute long voicemail, and we're played on the show and answer your question. So, it's something we're really excited to bring over to the show, and I, I think it it's honestly is cool. Like, I would love to have that happen if I was the listener to the podcast. So I'm happy that we were able to make that work on this show as well. 
Yeah, as somebody who's like had question. I mean, I think I've had a question read on a Magic podcast, and you've had a question read on a Magic podcast, Mason. And it, I mean, it feels good to be to have the specific thing that you want to hear these people that you're supporting talk about. And uh, you know, we want to do that for our listeners, and we want to invite them to be a part of the show that way. So, for sure, hundred percent. All right. Well, uh, Trey, do you have anything to say on the uh, updated tier other than people should check it out? No, definitely check it out. And the the, the voicemail thing is always something that's really cool, right? You guys hear us talk uh, enough as it is. And so having you on the show directly is something that's a lot of fun. And uh, it was something that was important for us that we did on Even Odds, and I'm happy to be doing it here. Yeah. Yeah. Even Odds forever, you know, baby. That's, that's, <laughs> that's the one. But not forgotten, never no, no, forgotten. No. What's dead can never die. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's move on to our next segment, which is hashtag always improving. Hashtag always improving is the point of this show. We want to be getting better all the time. Magic's a really tough game. Uh, some Kotaku articles would say it's the literal hardest game ever of all time. And, uh, you know, that, that means it's probably pretty tough to be getting better doing the things that you're supposed to be doing and, and could be doing to, you know, be always improving. And that's our goal each week. So, Trey, what have you done this week? Uh, to improve a magic or life in general? Well, this week was a little bit tough. I was traveling this week. I was in Cleveland for five days, not playing magic. <clears throat> but during that time, I was still trying to uh, read articles and look at what was going on in modern because we've got SCG Louisville coming up that we're attending. And so I was in group chats and texting a lot with the guys that were going to that, um, trying to make deck list selections and choices on cards and uh, trying to talk uh, Blake, friend of the podcast, out from playing Black and Arclight Phoenix. I don't know that I'm going to be successful, but I'm trying. <laughs> Whoa, I'm coming, Blake. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on my way to help. Um, but it was a thing. It was a good, uh, it's always a good reminder that like just because you're not in a situation where you can get the games in, there's always things that you can be doing, whether it's looking at information or talking about the game or looking at things that other people are doing in order to try to prepare yourself for whatever the next event is. Yeah. Also, you hit Mythic. Yeah. Well, that was, I, I, I flew in and landed and I got back home and my wife went to bed and then I just played arena till like 2 a.m. So it was, uh, so like a, a normal day for you. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Still just a degenerate. Yeah. You know, I, I really, uh, Mason didn't, didn't give men, uh, Michael an anti shout out for that to, to just now, but it, that was really reminiscent of Michael, you know, coming on the show and talking about the times where he would do things outside of the game. Uh, to improve it what mason <laughs> I'm, not, I'm just laughing because if you've ever listened to the old school season not even i guess i'm in old school i guess it's middle school now the way that it works it's like the silver age almost but <laughs> I, I, there was always this joke i would have with hinder rocker because i used to work behind the scenes there where he would take a week off magic and he'd just be like you know i worked on myself this week and that was like his always <laughs> improving go-to where he'd be like i just took time away from magic so that's what spencer's referencing when he said i didn't give an anti shout out i only give shout outs to michael hinder rocker rest in peace watsy staff i would never give an anti shout out <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 but I do think that it's important to realize. Um, yeah, it was really funny. I got a weird message, so I tweeted that I had. This kind of falls into your thing, Trey. I tweeted that my app that I was using to draft on, just like when I'm like sitting there doing nothing and like want to just open packs, and stuff. Uh, I, I tweeted that that I had you know, it stopped updating. So I was looking for a new draft app and somebody messaged me. They're like, why would you waste your time with a draft app? That's just garbage. They never have good pick orders. And I'm like, because I can do like 15 drafts a week that way. Yeah. Really also, fast. Do the arena bots have good pick orders? I think <laughs> That's why I, like, right. I was thinking it. <laughs> I know, buddy. I know where you're at. <laughs> but, but no, yeah. it's, it's the same thing. It's like, I, I, you know, I have the time for what I have the time for. And I'm gonna. I want to maximize that. That's part of always improving is knowing knowing how to use your time. So I think that's a really good one, Trey. Yeah, it's all, also it's like the, I don't know your thing there, Spencer. It's like what's probably better for you if you're trying to improve in magic, right? Like thinking about like picking between this card and this card, even if the picks aren't great, or like scrolling through Twitter for the seventeenth time today. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, absolutely. It's just like I, you're being Twitter. really lenient, only <laughs> thinking that I scroll through Twitter that many times. But. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You know what I mean? But still, it's it's all about like. You might not be getting like the best practice in the world, but would you have been able to get any practice at all if you didn't have that app or you couldn't read exactly? Yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, and that was part of it with what I did. You know, I was primarily focused on modern, but I was looking at what was happening with the standard metagame and seeing things changing and then got back and was like, well, I'm going to play a little arena, changed like 
six cards in Grixis midrange and then played it to Mythic, like because I'd been paying attention to what was going on, even though I wasn't actively playing. You know, we we'll probably I don't know when we'll talk about this, but I, I would love to to talk to you about the Kefnet in your deck because I think Kefnet fits into Grixis better than it fits into any of the other archetypes. So I was really glad glad to see that in your list. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we'll get to Kefnet. I, I'm still trying to figure out if I like Kefnet or not. Three yeah. weeks later. <laughs> So I'll get to uh, my always improving moment. Um, so uh, this weekend I got to travel to Boise. Super shout out to Jim uh, who gave me a you know a couch to sleep on to you know make that cost super low for the trip. Um, but yeah, I I uh, got to go to Boise this weekend and play in an MCQ. And uh, I called my shot real early on this one. I text multiple people <laughs> the week before. That I was going to win throughout the day, people were like tweeting at me, like, "Hey, win this thing!" And I was like, "Yeah, that that's what I'm gonna do. I'm I'm going to win. Like that's happening." Uh, and I did not lose a match until my deck decided in games two of three of the quarterfinals to not give me any lands. Uh, I yeah, didn't draw a land in game two, and then um, uh, didn't draw a fourth land until turn six, and a fifth land until like turn eleven uh, against Mono Red in the quarters. And it's really funny. I like wasn't upset at all, and it, I went and got food during the second to last round when I drew when I drew in before my play draw decision. And uh, I I was saying to myself, you know, in the car, it's like kind of just you know having kind of some inner dialogue. And I was saying, you know, your plan is to win this event. Like you're going to win, but if you don't, it's not going to be because you didn't play well. It's not going to be because you weren't prepared. It's not going to be because you picked the wrong deck. Like you're you're going to do your best to win this event. And you know, I I don't know if I told Mason this. I it was either Mason or Matt. I was telling a, a you know a week or so ago that something that I needed to get back to is having confidence in Magic. And I just doubt myself all the time in Magic. I have like this huge imposter syndrome that I was just decided that I was going to end like. I know that I'm good enough to win a PTQ. I I know, but like I don't I don't need to prove it to anybody other than myself, which already knows it. So uh, having confidence allowed me to do something really different. I you would think that having confidence would mean that I sped up in my games of Magic, but that actually isn't true. I actually slowed down because I knew that I could figure out any problem that was in front of me, and was able to just stop, think about it, and adjust. And it was really cool, uh, really powerful to have that moment of going down and realizing like I know how to solve this problem it's just about putting in the work to do it and then doing that um in in the in the top eight I played against a a former world's competitor top eight you know top eight at grand prix and you know I, I I they played very well but I think that I sold a bluff really well that got me four extra draw steps that I just shouldn't have had and you know I, I played well I knew what my outs were and I, and I did it and uh I, it's really easy to be mad when something like this happens but i don't think that i'm mad that i didn't win this mcq i'm really pleased with how well i played and i just have to do that again this weekend at oasis proud sponsor of constructed criticism <laughs> yeah no it, it was it was it felt good to not have self-doubt like it felt really good yeah, I um I was listening to Table for Two today, which is KYT and Alexander Haynes' new podcast, and he mentioned that. I don't know if you had heard that. The I think I messaged you actually, I because you said you'd watch the show. Yeah, but he mentions how like when he was first starting to like come into it, he had to like get confidence in himself and trust that like he is going you know to make these decisions and do these kind of things. And I think it's important to be confident in yourself. Yeah, I think for for me a huge part of it, I was already having these thoughts about myself and like how I wanted to adjust my magic game, and you know what I wanted my magic goals to look like. Over, you know, now that you two had joined joined the show, and then I was listening to the Arena Decklist podcast, and Nick Prince came on, and Nick was talking kind of not the best about himself, but Jerry was like, "No, like this is this is the truth. This is what you should think of yourself." And it was it was those words from Jerry that I was like, you know what? Like, screw this. I've day two to Pro Tour before. I've top aided a large portion of my Grand Prix I've played, and I've cashed Grand Prix. You know, I top eight. You know, I won a PPDQ every season that I wanted to. Like, I don't know why I have this problem with myself right now, and just deciding to not have that problem 
was really powerful. Like I literally just decided not to have it. And I people might sound think that sounds weird, but like that's what happened. I'm just I'm not gonna pretend like I'm not good enough for the sake of being humble when I can be humble and also think that I'm good enough to go to the pro tour. Yeah, I mean I think that's great. So mm-hmm. anyway, it's kind of a weird that humble beast. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that was that was my always improving this week. Um, Gruel was great, by the way. It was validated very much so in my thinking. And uh, one of the people asked, you know, a bunch of people, you know, had heard me talking about Big Red, and uh, you know, the 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 two decks that I was considering for the MCQ were Mono Red and Big Red. And then when it came to the MCQ, it was like, well, I can just have the best of both of these worlds and put these Sarkins in my and Chandra's in my Gruel deck, and it it turned out great. Like the deck was really powerful. Yeah, that's awesome. I I'm always gonna be biased to Gruel in my heart now. Got like that's our first SCG top eight. Pretty happy about that. So yeah, every time someone brings up a Gruel deck, I'm like, oh, is that a, a Gruel deck? You said I am interested in seeing this list. Would you like to show me? <laughs> sure. So I, I'm down for the clan for life now. Me and the Gruels, for cool. sure. Mason, what about you? What did you do to improve at Magical Life this week? So I went and I played the MCQ on uh, Saturday, and it didn't go the best. I, I finished X and 2, but I died pretty early into the event. So I was just kind of playing because uh, a weird backstory. There's like a horse race that was near my house, and the roads were closed down. So like I was dead pretty early, and if it wasn't for that, I would have gone home earlier, right? But I was stuck at the event because I had to wait in traffic for two hours because I, I was like, I can sit here with friends. And hang out for two hours. Hold on. Time out. All right, let's I, you're not just going over this. <laughs> there was a horse race uh-huh. near your house. Were they uh-huh. were they running on the streets? I don't understand. Uh, well, so let's go a little let's go a little deep on local national culture. How about that? This is a deep cut for the Nashvillians out there. So there's this thing called Steeplechase, which is a horse track that's near my house. And it's okay. an event where they people come and they day drink and they watch horse races and it shuts down this like two roads. The problem is the only two roads to get to my house are the roads that are shut down. So it takes like two hours to travel what's normally like a two minute trip. I've done it before, like two years ago. I like went out earlier in the day and I got home earlier than I like I thought people chasing it around a certain time. I was home like an hour earlier and I just waited for an hour and a half to get home. And it was just miserable. So I hung out at the store well, at the MCQ, I should say, until about the time when it ended and I left, which turned out to be the last round. So kind of played out, excuse me, pretty well for that. But that wasn't my always improving moment. That was a uh, Nashville horse racing it, moment. I mean, it does sound like you improved at life in this moment. Because I did, yeah. You had, you had made a mistake, and you did not make that mistake this time. I'm really proud of you. A lot of people don't do that. Thank you, yeah. It means a lot, you know, uh, hashtag always improving. But <laughs> jokes aside, but what really happened is I got home, and I was like, okay, I've got a IQ that I need to play for in a coming week. And a lot of people have been saying that Esper Midrange is really good. And there's been like a lot of really high praise about the deck. The deck did really well and uh, in events the week prior to it. And I saw some lists uh, when I was at the MCQ. And I wasn't really happy with those lists. Like I looked through some people's decks and whatnot. And I wasn't quite feeling it. And I was like, okay, well, I'm going to try and take a shell and I'm going to put my own spin on it and see how it goes. I had fallen to like the low seventies or eighties on mythic uh, in the last week. Cause I hadn't played much and I lost a couple of games that night uh, playing the planeswalker deck and kind of not giving it my all. And so I was like, all right, I'm just going to play this deck, make these changes, see how I like it. And just listen to other people. If other people tell me I should play the deck like this and this kind of play pattern with this in mind, and it's going to reward them that I'm going to trust them. And I'm going to be willing to be wrong in this situation. And I did it, and then I got all the way up to, like, rank 13, and then the next day I got to, like, rank 8 on Mythic, and I've been stuck at 8. I, like, lose a game and fall 10 spots, and I have to, like, win 3 to get back to 8. I can't get to 1. But, uh, yeah, it was just a moment of being, like, even though I'm not a big fan of this deck and I think it's not good, I'm willing to, like, invest my time to see if, A, I'm wrong, or, B, you know, p- other people are right. I'm sorry, if, you, if I'm right where people, other people are right, right? And I'm willing to just take this advice and go for it, even if I don't think it's the best going into it. So there was a, it was a good moment, and I really like the Esper midrange deck. I'm a big fan of midrange decks, so once I kind of, like, I took people's advice, like some stuff that Matt said and some stuff that Jerry said on the Arena Decklist podcast, and I kind of took that to heart and played it, and I haven't <laughs> really lost very much. 
it's just when you lose in the high mythics, you fall really far if you lose to anyone who's not near you in the ranks. So, yeah. You know who never falls too far is our sponsor at Oasis Games. Trey, take it away, baby. <laughs> Hello, fellow Magic competitor. I try to keep myself busy. I try to focus my energies on the mental tasks that make up a menial day. I try to stay busy, answer emails, take phone calls, you know, for old time's sake. I check Facebook. I check the mail. I check the phone again. But you know it won't do any good. If you're like me, and I think you are, my face may say, of course I'm working. But behind my eyes is a nonstop commercial kitchen of technology, trying to bake the perfect color pie that will finally make the Planeswalker deck truly competitive this week. And how can I get my hands on all the necessary ingredients to test out my devilish confections? You know the answer, friends. I hurry over to the good folks at Oasis Games. That's right, mtgoasis.com is the best place to impulse buy all your insane card selections. You can try them out now with code CCMTG for 15% off your first order. And you can use code Would That Be Good for 4% off every order. So pop on over to mtgoasis.com today and tell them CCMTG sent you. What's with the baked goods? Why is it? <laughs> are you sister cry? Do you want a, a pie, buddy? Do I need to bring you no, one? Buddy. Okay, all right. I just I'm noticing I'm noticing a trend in the ads, and if you're like me and I think you are, and you're listening appropriately, you'll notice it too. <laughs> you know who does have pie? It's our sponsor at Oasis Games. You can get a slice of pie over in that cafe this weekend at the MCQ. Also, I totally knew that. <laughs> yeah. we're flying out of the mcq right like that's that's just the grinder life <laughs> hey, if you guys if you guys want to fly out i will i will put you up it is hard to pass up the local iq that's 30 minutes away but i'll consider it <laughs> for sure let's go to our newest segment thank you so much to our sponsors at oasis games but now it's time for biggest mover so biggest mover is brought to you by our sister show, Limited Time Only, which is coming back. So check him out. Uh, I don't know. It's this guy, Danny, this, this dude, Spencer. They talk about arena draft now. Uh, it's a new new arena-focused limited podcast. Episode 100 airs soon. <laughs> I have a question. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, what episode are you on? My, no. sec- my second question is, is it lim- really limited time only if I can leave my arena draft going all day and never make a pick? Asking for a friend. <laughs> mm, I see. Uh, so episode 100 is the next episode. That was on purpose. That was the thing that I did. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, it's, it's exciting. But Biggest Mover is a new segment for Constructive Criticism. Who knows how long it will last, but we either talk about a card or a deck that has moved the most for us in the Constructive metagame this week, whether it's Popper, Modern, Standard, Limited, any of Limited, not Limited. Uh <laughs> We We're respect not limited here. I got an arena draft going. All right. <laughs> All right. All right. What pick are you on? But uh, hey. uh, I don't know. I haven't listened to the newest episode, so I'm really lost. <laughs> yeah, there you go. But yeah, I, I every week on the show, we want to talk about if as long as the show, the segment works, uh, we want to talk about, you know, something that's moving in the meta game, something that we thought is doing better, something that we thought is doing worse. So this week, my biggest mover, only risk factor. Uh, is what? my biggest mover this week. <laughs> what a left turn. Yeah, I know. I, I got something. I'll be back. I'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> Risk Factor was so bad. It's so bad right now, Trey. I don't even know what matchups this card is good in. You, you're First of all, you're not playing as many Screw of the Critics, so you're playing less burn spells, which means that your opponent's life total is a little bit higher. They can more afford to, you know, just take the life from risk factor your deck's a little bit slower it's even slower than it was before because chandra is so good that you're playing chandra's and and experimental frenzies in some mix and chandra is so much better than risk factor i would never play risk factor over it i just i'm done i'm done with risk factor i think that the card is now what everybody accused of being when people started playing the game with it and uh you know it, it was good for a hot minute but i i wouldn't be caught with risk factor in my red lists right now so now it's browbeat. It's officially browbeat. Oh my gosh! Like it's unplayable it's, browbeat. What it, <laughs> I noticed you threw it to Spencer. I can see your agenda. <laughs> oh my goodness! I don't know what's happening right now. Wait, do, did you not listen to Even Odds Pod? This was a, uh, a reoccurring thing that Trey hates Risk Factor. <laughs> he despises it in I all do. and since the beginning, which is just wrong. Just just for the record, it was wrong. Risk Factor was great. 
So, Spencer, my question for you is this. Did you mean in the main deck and the side deck? What are you talking? Are you talking all together? I was, I was playing in the sideboard today. I played quite a few matches. Okay. Um, I think that the card is just not good in any matchups right now. Hmm. What would you play so, over it, just out of curiosity? Just like, other spells, like, like Legion War Boss or... Uh, first of all, Tybalt's really, really good out of the sideboard in this deck. So the fact that you have Tybalt means that... You know, even if you were trying to go lower to the ground or something, even if you were trying to burn your opponent out, I'd rather be playing Tibalt, Tibalt Banefire than, than Risk Factor. Because hmm. you, you're discarding extra lands with Risk Factor anyway, so why not just Banefire them? Uh, Trey, what, what do you have to say about this? I knew you had to say something. I don't want to interrupt you. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that the situation comes down to is that the, the addition of Chandra probably has more to do with it than anything else. Oh, absolutely. Is that, is that Red now just has more good draw spells than it needs and that something has to take a back seat because you have too many options available to you for card advantage in red which is preposterous in and of itself but there is just more than you can real reasonably play like if you're playing risk factor and light up the stage and chandra and experimental frenzy like your deck what is your deck doing other than just drawing cards like it needs to also still do something what else does my deck need to do i love drawing cards but that's the that's the <laughs> problem with risk factors it's just like yeah i'll take eight like you haven't done anything yet. All you've done is draw cards. I, I, you need the cards to be the cards that Risk Factor is play, like replacing is you know the cards that need to actually be making an impact on the game outside of ultimating your Chandra. Interesting. Okay. A and I'm also, the card was already bad with Experimental Frenzy, so like it's not like it's it's not like the the card those two cards ever worked well together. So now that you're just playing more Experimental Frenzy type cards, uh, it's just not worth. That's interesting. So I've, but see, that's that's an interesting statement about that one because I noticed that most people are playing like three Chandra, two Frenzy seems to be like what people have decided. So you're actually on lower on Frenzy than you were before, right? Or are they sideboarding the Frenzies? I just didn't notice. No, no, no. The, they, you, you're right. But the thing is, it's also not good with Chandra. Well, I mean, it's well, okay. Sorry, Trey. What are you gonna say? Well, I was gonna say that like the deck before was playing, you know, between eight to nine draw spells through some combination of light up the stage experimental frenzy and risk factor and the thing is that the deck still wants to play approximately that same number of draw spells it's just that you're playing more chandras now than you were something else and i think that that's really the issue more than anything else is that i think that chandra is a better draw spell than what you would be getting out yeah. of risk factor more than risk factor being a bad card despite so, as much as it hurts me to say that chandra protects itself in a really big way right by making it that when you're attacking chandra they're taking damage for sure right mm -hmm. so the problem is is that I need to be pressuring my opponent in a really meaningful way, and it needs to be constant pressure as long as Chandra's in play, or it needs to be able to block for Chandra. Okay. So because of that, Risk Factor does neither of those things, and you just can't afford to play it. Interesting. So I was only bringing... I, so I should say this. I am not a, like, a aggro red mage. I think it's one of the weakest part of my games is aggressive decks. I think I'm not particularly great at them. And so maybe this hashtag is a quest for 10, baby. That's how you fix it. So may maybe maybe this is just me sideboarding wrong. I was only bringing risk factor in against decks that don't pressure my plane. Wouldn't, wouldn't pressure a planeswalker anyway. So, example, Esper and stuff like that. So when you started on this, I thought you were going to say it's because the like the Esper deck has cards like Narset now that make it worse. And then it's not as good in other matchups. But I'm just I'm curious. So were you bringing in other matchups as well where they would pressure Chandra? Should, should I be bringing risk factor in before, do you think? So the risk factors before were coming in when you were boarding out experimental frenzies and becoming a pure a pure burn deck, okay. and that works really well on like the the nineteen and eighteen land versions with skewer the critics. But okay. I think those versions are bad right now, which means that this the plan is worse. Okay, cool. All right, that makes sense. I I feel I feel where you're coming from, Trey. What's your biggest mover? Uh, my biggest mover is trending down, and that is the Bant mid range deck. Um, it was only a week ago that this deck was like the hot new deck and it was, you know, everyone was trying to figure out new iterations of it and what it is that they wanted to do. And they were trying to go deep into the lab on it. And, uh, the problem is, is that this doesn't interact very well with what's going on in the rest of the metagame, uh, particularly with the rise of the Esper mid range deck. Like you're playing like four mana flash counter spells and no real removal of any kind. And the, your opponent's playing like cheaper stickier threats that then also have a bunch of removal and board wipes it's just not particularly uh, effective or useful and um i think that there are a lot less reasons right now to be playing that deck than there were even seven days ago spencer people on the video podcast saw you reacting <laughs> now here's the question though was that thumbs down at trey or thumbs down at bam midrange oh thumbs down at bam midrange holy crap is this deck bad 
Uh, so last week on the podcast, Trey and I called the deck sweet. And Mason asked us if we meant that we thought the deck was bad. And at the time, I didn't mean that the deck was bad. I meant that the deck was, in fact, sweet. And now that I have watched so many people flounder with this deck, uh, yeah, this deck is sweet in the it's not very good, you shouldn't play it kind of way. Yeah, so here, I I mean, like I kind of alluded to last week that I thought the deck was sweet, and I meant in a way that I wouldn't play it. So we, I think we know where I stand on it. But there is one card that has really impressed me out of that deck, and that's Oketra. So I'm going to kind of hijack part of Trace here. Whoa. Whoa. What's up? Don't tell people to play that card. That card's great. I don't want to I don't want to play against that card. <laughs> it's very good. No, nobody <laughs> wants to play against that card. I want to play with that card. Why are you evil? Well, first as a child. <laughs> so, All yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. into this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That He's might be too much. Horse race as a small boy. <laughs> so, yeah. and, they <laughs> and all the day drinking really got to me. And let me see the evil of the world. <laughs> but uh Jokes. He said, bring me a geld link, and then he went from there. <laughs> yeah. That's but, a small horse for anyone who doesn't know. About that this. was a deep cut trail. I like that. Thank you. As someone who lives here, Super Chase, I obviously knew what you meant. Uh, <laughs> but so, yeah, I mean, I think, like, I guess I don't want to hijack your thing too much, Trey. Here's my biggest problem with the Bant deck. I'm curious what you two think, because I don't want to spend the whole time trashing this deck, because I think there are good parts of the deck uh, that I would like to take and do other things with. But A, I think the fact that you're a flash deck is a drawback, not a benefit right now. And B, uh, I think the mana is terrible beyond belief. What do you two think of those two statements? Go. Factual and factual. Okay. And also, also, uh, as sweet as Teferi is, um, you know, Teferi's, Teferi's good against a deck that was really, really popular week one. And it probably would have been my biggest mover down had I had a mover down this week that was a deck. Uh, and that's Nexus. I think Nexus also would be a, a pretty big mover down. And this deck is really good against that deck and just kind of not that good outside of that. Yeah, I mean, I think that the mana is really bad, especially when you're trying to play all of the different kinds of combinations of things that you're doing. It's really mana intensive. Um, also trying to focus on being a flash deck and trying to focus on your primary interaction being counter spells, you know, at the time that Teferi is the like go to three drop for a lot of decks is a really bad place to be. Like, I don't know how many times I've played against that deck and they just have a bunch of frilled mystics in their hand that they can't cast or Dovin's vetoes in their hand that they can't cast wah, or deputy of wah, detentions that they wah. cast that then don't do anything because you just remove them. Like the, the deck doesn't just interact effectively because of the way the rest of the metagame is shaped, shaped up. I think if it wasn't for three drop to fairy, then there might be more options for the deck. Okay, cool. Yeah. You know what though? I did see bent hero decks that looked sweet that played like Dovin's Veto and stuff like that. And like instead of being this like very in creature intensive deck, we're just like straight up mid range decks. Um, that could be a way that this deck could could adapt and move forward. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I guess for mine. My biggest mover is going to be a biggest mover up, actually. I decided to go a positive route. <laughs> and that's Good job, Mason. Finale of Devastation, I believe, is the, the green finale. It is green X. Oh, it's green, green X. And then you can put a creature from your library or your graveyard onto the battlefield that's equal to that mana cost. And then you exile the finale. Where I believe the finale actually just goes to the graveyard. I don't believe that one exiles. I believe the blue one does. Either way, this is a card that I've been trying and testing in the Primeval Titan deck as a actual sideboard option against decks that whose game plan are, I'm going to run you out of threats and then try and win the game from there. And I think it's pretty reasonable. It basically just adds two mana to all of your green tutor targets you're already playing before. So like Hornet Queen, Primeval Titan, Tireless Tracker, Ramanop Excavator, and Reclamation Sage now all are like two more to go get, and you can use them a second time, which is pretty dope. So you could, excuse me, find them in moments you really need them, and you can bring them back if they like answer them and you're like okay that was cool that you beat my hornet queen with your creature deck let's run it back and see if you can do it again so i think it's like an interesting tool that adds a lot to the deck and the deck has gotten a lot of new toolboxes like i think there's some karn stuff going on that's really cool i think people are going too deep on and then there's this that let you play even more green creatures and reoccur them and like now i'm like doing gatherer searches for things that etb and die and so like they have triggers on both ends or something like that so that way i can use more cards just a lot of really cool things going on in that spot what do you two think about that card in modern? I know you two aren't primetime boys, but 
Whoa. Well, not Amulet Boy. Sorry, I should. I should. Read Whoa. It. My bad. Right, so Trey, I, I'm having an always improving moment right now, and I just want to confirm to you, with with you, I should say, if I create a new segment for the show and it is open to interpretation as to what you can talk about on that segment for each host, mm-hmm. will, will Mason always use that as an opportunity to talk about Titan? Correct. Okay, yes. that's good to know. All, All right, always. I'm glad that we learned <laughs> <Forever>. that. Yeah. <laughs> He has one love, and it is great. <laughs> uh, I do want to say at least briefly so that we can get this. Uh, finale of Devastation is, is Green Green X. Search your library and or graveyard for a creature card with converted mana cost X or less. Put it onto the battlefield. Uh, and then if X is 10 or more, the creature gets plus X plus X in haste. Um, where, you know, obviously the value of X is set. Just so we have that clear because we kind of were all yeah. over the place on it. Yeah, I totally forgot that last part. Thank you. That is, that is a part of the card that hasn't come up for me yet, so I just haven't thought about it. But it is part of the reason I put it there too is that it does double as a win condition in the late game against those decks that plan are like discard your Titans, kill your Titans, all that kind of stuff and kill the extra threats you bring in. Since late game, you can be like X is 12, bring back a tr- secure trap scout, hit you for 13. So, so my, my first thought, and I, and I think I know the answer to this, Mason, what is the draw to playing the finale versus playing like green sun Zenith that you already had access to because the deck because had access banned. to that and uh, wasn't doing it. Well, green sun Zenith is banned in Great. modern. Did you not know that? No, nah, I don't keep up with green cards. <laughs> <useless> to me. <laughs> well, let me tell you a little secret. If green sensing it was legal, the format would be look a lot different, and so would my primeval titan deck. Because Good. all I try to do is get a lot of mana really quickly. So green to rant myself would be. They, in they the banned market. green sun zenith with wild nacazel because they said it made all green decks look the same. Yeah. As far as I'm concerned, all green cards are banned. Oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> I'm not sure if he actually knew it was banned or not, and he wanted to make this joke where he's using the joke to get out of the fact he didn't know it was banned. And I think it's this latter. I really think he thought that card was legal. No, I think that that's a good mover. It's interesting. Did you, is it actually a mover for you? Like, did you not think that it would be playable going in? I thought it was like a reasonable card to consider, and then I played with it and was pretty impressed. So I kind of moved it up. And sure. it's a card that I've seen some people talk about. A lot of people are really high on Carnulet right now. Or like, I shouldn't say high. A lot of people are going really deep and seeing if it's good enough. And I think uh, Brian on Arena Deckless Podcast kind of nailed it. Where like, and Jerry too, like they're having like these nine wish sideboard cards. It's like, we already have a wish package. We're not a wish package, but like a, a tutor package for our cyborg creatures with Summoner's Pact and like Teleria West to go get that. So we can already get our cyborg cards pretty easily. So if I'm going to play Karn, I kind of want to play it as like a light splash. And so Finale Revelation does like a different thing in my mind that's pretty powerful. So Why does everything have to be lit? Why, well, you know, like you guys need to chill out. This is like the same thing that happened with Gate, where everything was was Crack Gate and Snap Gate and Black Gate and blah, blah, blah Gate. Like not everything's lit, man. Not well, everything's lit, Mason. When you, when you have no bad matchups, life is great. And so thus things are and lit. T- Th- things are lit. All right. Yes. I-, I subscribed to Emma on Twitch so I could get the lit for when I needed amulet tie and stuff. <laughs> Boom. Shout out to you, Emma. But uh, yeah, so I- I- that's something that's interesting. I don't know what you two think. Do you think that's like, I know you're not amulet boys like me, but is that something that's interesting to you? Does that sound like something that would be a, a thorn in your side? What do you think just in the abstract before we move on? No, just quick I- thoughts. I-, I, think- I think that um, I don't like the Hornet Queen comment because you know, I, I think that if you've gotten to that point in the game, you've probably already won with anything in Amulet Titan. So it's just like, like if you've gotten to the point where you're bringing back a Hornet Queen they've killed, mm-hmm. I think I think you've probably already won. Oh, against like Jeff Guy and stuff like that, and Jund, like the Jund style decks, that makes sense. They they, they can kill it pretty effectively. What with do the they do clear. with the Death Touchers? Well, so specifically, some of those decks have like Maelstrom Pulse, so they can answer all the, the creatures, or they have like Supreme Verdict. And so, like, it taxes their, like, so against, like, Blue White, for example, you tax their paths really well, but you don't tax their Terminus and, uh, well, Terminus, obviously, well, whatever, Terminus and Supreme Verdict very easily with a, with a Hornet Queen. So it's a card that you bring in because you need more threats because they're really good at killing all your threats, and Finale sure. doubles as another copy of all those threats. So Awesome. That's a good answer. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, that is it for this week's Biggest Movers. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not going to lie, guys, I enjoyed that segment. I thought it was fun. Yeah, I have a message on our podcast thing. I just saw here that says, I love this segment. A, <laughs> I, I thought it was fun, yeah. We went, we wanted to try this segment. In case you couldn't tell, this was something that like we weren't sure if it was going to play right, so we want to give it a couple weeks and see if we like it or not. So I think it's fun. Yeah, we're, do- we're doing it next week, so stay tuned for our Biggest Movers next week <laughs> where Mason talks about his biggest mover down in Amulet Titan. <laughs> yeah. Spoilers. It's coming. <laughs> Let's talk about our training guys this week. And this is... 
um, kind of linked to what would have been my biggest mover that, that Mason was hinting at, as well as something that Mason talked about during his Always Improving segment. Next week, we're actually going to do an episode on on the Esper Hero deck. Um, but before we do that, one of the things that is the most commonly asked questions is, how do you do, what do you do in this matchup? What do you do in this matchup? What do you do in this matchup? And so to give people a tool, I just actually want to talk about how to break down a matchup. So when you're playing a deck, how do you understand who's favored and who's not favored in an, any given matchup? And I just want to talk about the things that go into that. So uh, let's let's kind of just break this down um, and start with, these aren't really in order, but I'll just start with key cards. So I think one of the first things that you should do when you you know are about to play a destiny matchup before you even start, I would really recommend, like, if you're playtesting with somebody, to talk about how you think the matchup's going to play out and the cards that you think are going to be impactful. Because it lets you both go in with, like, an equal footing so that there's not, like, these moments of, like, some person knowing that the matchup's about this and the other person thinking it's about this. And then you both, like, the person, one of you is right, and they just obliterate the other one. So all of a sudden, you think that the matchup's, like, 100-0. You're like, I could never lose. When, in fact, had the other person just had the same information you had, you could actually really gather what that matchup was about, what the key cards were. Mason? Yeah, sure. I, I, I think that is a really good point. Like, when it comes to, like, figuring out what matters in a matchup and kind of finding, like, the truth, for lack of a better word. I think it's important when you sit down this play testing to have conversations about how you think the matchup's going to play out and what cards you think matters, especially if you're trying to like min max your time. Like if you have pre assumptions, you should use the time you've already thought about these things and share it with your play test partner or whoever you're play testing with. That way they can also have that information. They can a critique that and be no going into the game, just like Spencer said. So like, for example, if you're playing the new blue white control deck in modern, you might be like, we're about to sit down and play the arc light matchup. It's like, I think Narset is the card that beats you and I'm never going to take it down. Or you could be the arc light player. And be like, I think Narset beats me. Do not take your Narset down. Cause that will expose it to one lightning bolt from me. And you're going to lose if you do that. And then you play the matchup and you have the information where if you just sit down, you're like, I'm going to play test blue white today and I'm playing against arc light Phoenix. That's the most popular modern deck. I'm going to play my Narset. Uh, this card goes down. So I guess I go down and then you just lose to a bolt when before you can maybe never well, lose. You've already, you've already done exactly what I'm talking about, right? You've mm -hmm. identified key cards. So now, you know, going into the matchup that Narset's a key card for me and I need to play around lightning bolt from you. That's two key cards already knocked out one conversation. And that's really going to like help you guide your play testing session as to what the next steps are and the things that you need to learn. Yeah. Trey, what do you think about that? I see you moving around over there. No, I think that that's true. And I think another part of it, in addition to just looking at what the cards are, are thinking about like where those things fall on the curve. Like, because you have, like, you're playing against decks, those fall in, in really big places on the curve. Like, say, for example, if you're playing against Nexus, even though we talked about how it's on the way down, right? Like, it becomes pretty common knowledge that, like, turn four is the big turn, right? Like, when they have four mana, you're going to know that they're going to be playing one of the cards that are going to really matter, whether that's Tamiyo or Wilderness Reclamation or whatever it is. But, like, knowing and being able to focus on, like, these are the turns when I can tap out or these are the turns when I need to be reactive based on, like, where the curves are going to line up. Yeah, and to you can go, let's go a little bit deeper to give people an example of what might happen if, like, me and Trey are playtesting, right? It's like, Trey, will, Trey would say, that, that's honestly something that, like, Trey would say to me. Like, we're eating and we're about to playtest, and it's like, yeah, I think turn four really matters. And I'll add, you got to pay attention to their mana as well, because on turn th two, if they leave up mana that could cast Growth Spiral, you're now looking at that turn coming a turn sooner. So make sure to keep that in mind of if you can beat a Tamiya or a Reclamation on turn three, assuming they have that. Since a lot of the times they do have a turn two play they want to do, like search for Esconta or develop a tap land because the deck has a reasonable number of tap lands. So that's just another moment of looking on those key turns, which is, you know, the next kind of really important thing, I think Trey alluded to it there, is you have to know the turns that matter in the matchup. Spencer, when you think about turns that matter, you know, in standard, what are some of the key turns that, like, pop out in your mind for decks like Mono Red, Esper, etc.? Yeah, I think you know one of the, one of the things that I that I think about is um, you know when you play like for example playing your search for contas in a control deck because that occupies my mana and does nothing right. So when I can do that depends on the matchups that I'm playing. So I can't do that if I think my opponent's going to play a key spell on a certain turn. I need to play it on turns where I don't think that they can play a key spell. Otherwise, I'm wasting a turn. Another way that this might come up is, you know, with the turns where your opponent has the ability to double spell. 
when your opponent has the ability to cast a chemistry's insight. These are the type of things where, you know, do I jam into this thing to stop them from being able to chemistry's insight? This this came up a lot when Glimmer of Genius happened, right? Because it was Glimmer of Genius was this one time effect that uh you know uh, that you really had they really had to make a decision as to whether they wanted to counter spell or use the format that they had saved for this uh another one is the things that you do before a wilderness reclamation comes down those are your most important turns in the entire game and understanding those key turns can can help you understand that matchup quite a bit can, those are can, just some of the ones go ahead i was gonna say can i hijack your thing real quick there yeah. So um, let's go back to Glimmer, and you can use Chemistry now since I think it plays out pretty similarly. One of the things that really matters against the control decks is knowing, like, hey, on turn three, if they leave their mana up, they have, like, Mortify and Absorb, right? And can I play around Absorb and make them sink their mana, essentially, right? And then if I do that on the fourth turn when they want to cast their Chemistries, can I force them to not cast their Chemistries, make it harder for them to develop on their fifth turn, which is the Teferi turn, which is, like, probably the most important turn? And by doing that, am I able to then pressure them and make it harder for them to develop towards their end game, which is like normally like slam a turn five to fairy, turn six to fairy, and protect it. So that is another moment of no- noticing the key turns, the key cards that matter. And so I think it's also just a great example of breaking down what we've been talking about so far. Yeah, that that one definitely, particularly against control. If you're if you're playing against control and they have three mana up on turn three and haven't played anything. Like just attack with whatever you have in play or do whatever. Like just take that turn off from casting things. Don't play into their game plan and let them just get free value every turn if you cast your stuff yeah, on turn four. Yeah, because next turn they're going to play an untapped land and try to chemistry's insight. Mm-hmm. So then you can play your spell and attack into that, making them decide what to do with their mana that turn. Right. Mm-hmm. And and oftentimes they have something that they may very well need. They may not have any more mana. They may not have any more answers after that. And they may let something resolve that they don't want to let resolve because they have to chemistry's on time. Mm-hmm. Um, in order to stay in the game. You know, with red, another good example that comes up a lot is on turn two. Your opponent plays a one drop and attacks in like Fanatical Firebrand, and the next turn they attack in, you know, before playing anything else. And you've got to be concerned because they could have light up a stage and that's bad, but what would really be bad is if they play Runaway Steamkin and you've wasted a removal spell on the Fanatical Firebrand and now you can't win. Can we Like that's actually... something that you have to really be focused on. Yeah, let's actually go even deeper on that because... One of the things that I find, for some reason, that I seem to get more of than a lot of people is kills on one runaway steamkin with Goblin Chain Whirler in my Gruel decks. And I think one of the things that people don't realize is, like, you can take some damage. You've got four fours in your deck. you got Sphinx, Sphinxes in your deck. you got the Goblin Chain Whirler in your hand. Or not Sphinxes, sorry, Phoenixes. Um, and it, it's, like, pretty important to, like, know how the red decks need to sequence to beat you. Right, and then planning your key turns accordingly, knowing when I need to cast this chain whirler to get the most value out of it, and not just wasting it the second that something comes up. The same thing is true of those shocks, right? If I use a shock on that one one that one one creature now with his goblin chain whirler in my hand, then you know I, I'm only going to get a little bit of value out of my chain whirler instead of possibly taking over the whole game by having this shock for something later. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and those those small decisions can really add up. I Trey watched me do this. Uh, our local store had a tournament recently. That was like, play with the event deck, and if you win, get a free pre-release. So I played the red event deck, and I was up against the white event deck. And I just, like, for some reason decided to shock one of the two ones to, like, save two life instead of trying to play to my Chain Whirler when, like, if I didn't use my... If I draw Chain Whirler, I, like, win the game because I three for one them. And if I don't, well, next turn I don't even have a play that can use all my mana for anyways, so I should try and, like, make a play towards that. And just yeah. you, being, like an active participant in your game and paying attention to the turns that matter and thinking about also what you can draw. Cause I think that's something that comes up too is like, it's like, okay, I don't have wilderness reclamation right now, but I know my key turn is turn four. I can play this gross spiral and draw another card, try and get to that reclamation. And even if I play my reclamation on my actual turn four, instead of turn three, when I have like five mana, let's say, cause the gross spiral, that's still good. I need to make plays that get me towards that. I need to opt towards that. So, yeah, and in, in important to this is like you know you have chain wheel in your deck. This is one of the key cards that we were talking about earlier. So now that we've identified it as the key card, what are the important turns for chain wheeler, and how can we get the most out of it? So a really good example of this is if my opponent is going to be able to lock it on the turn after, and I have an opportunity to chain wheeler now and get rid of some creatures, I should probably do it now instead of getting greedy. It's about what are your key cards. When do they let up? What are the key turns? And I think that's that's really important. Yeah. Can we, so 
I'm sorry, Joe, what are you going to say? No, I was just going to say one last thing, you know, in regards to the key turns is that when you have limited resources uh, available, like you, you only have, you know, one removal spell or you only have one counter spell or you only have one interactive spell of some kind and your opponent plays something and that thing is bad for you. And you're like, well, I'm getting good value because I'm targeting something that's bad, but it's on one of those key turns where you're like, so they could do something where you can never come back and you're going to lose the game, right? And that once you can identify what those key turns are and what those key cards are, then you can like leverage what your cards are that you have access to in order to make those decisions in a way that like, okay, a bad thing happened to me and I got okay value out of what it is that I'm doing. But if I have knowledge about what it is that I'm looking at, then you can make those decisions in order to try to like move yourself forward. Yeah, for sure. I, I want to kind of take everything we said. I really love how this all builds on itself. So let's kind of use a similar example of mono red on like the play versus the draw, right? So if you're playing against mono white on the draw, right, you might not normally shock because I, like I just talked about, if you shock in that kind of situation, you're wasting the value off a of chain whirler. But you also know that on the play, one of the best things that mono white can do is turn three loxodon so their creatures don't die to a chain whirler. So if you shock on this turn or Wizards Lightning, whatever interaction spell you have, right, on turn two, then you are preventing them from developing their locks on, which will make them commit more to the board, which plays into your game plan. And while if you're on the play, you're going to kind of do what we talked about a second ago, right? Which is just jam my stuff onto the board, whatever. I'm going to develop my board. You're going to play some 1-1s one or X-1s, and then boom, chain whirl, you're dead. So I think that's another example of kind of doing the play and draw. What are some of the things you guys think about with play draw? Because I think thinking about how you you can interact on your opponent's turn and disrupt their game plan is a big one. But there's also a lot of other little things that go with play draw. Yeah, I think that um, it's pretty common for I think in constructed it, it you know you're you're typically substantially favored on the play, so because of that, I think that people think about games in those in those in that way more often because those are the games that they win more. Mm-hmm. But uh, you know, I played a game against a, a friend of a friend of mine, Josh Wheaton, and that you know he was on the draw and just played perfectly with mono red, not playing things into chain whirl or not doing different things. When you're on the draw with mono red, for example, don't jam your steamkin into chain whirler mana. Like, don't do it. <laughs> wait, wait. Uh, and it actually from watching him do this, I was able to win more matches with mono red myself today on the draw because I had witnessed this and thought, that's so smart. I don't know why I didn't think of that. And it, a lot of things in Magic are so simple. Once you once you see somebody do something, you're like, that makes so much sense. I can't believe I didn't think about that. And I think understanding a matchup, it's pretty often, that's the reason people want your key points in a matchup is because once you have them, you're able to easily identify things and it gets easier and easier. And it kind of snowballs, kind of like what Mason said. All of these things build on top of each other and it just makes it a lot easier. Yeah, for sure. I have a question for you because you said that generally you think uh, the player is favored if they go first and constructed, which I think I agree. Do you remember the last time you took the draw and constructed on purpose? Like, yeah, it was the Cobblade Mirror. Wow, that was a long time ago. Trey, do you remember? Uh, I I don't. <laughs> I, I, don't even, I did mine on if, Saturday, so <laughs> I don't even know if I was. I don't even know if I was supposed to in the Cobblade Mirror for what it's worth. Yeah. I think I think that that there was two lines of thought on that, so. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I think in general that the, the statistics line up so significantly in favor of the play in Constructed that even if there is a matchup where it might be favored to take the draw, the amount of effort that it would take to try to determine whether or not that that's right is probably time that's not well spent. Yeah, that's fair. I, I took the draw on uh, Saturday, so that's why I was curious. I did it at the MCQ. <laughs> <laughs> I played against an S for Control deck, and his deck seemed kind of uh, interesting. And so I, like took the draw <laughs> yeah the, and the other the, the, i guess yeah, the natural conclusion of the reason that i say that is because the 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 amount that you lose out on potentially by getting that wrong is pretty high you know based on the things that line up statistically um I, okay. one, one other example i wanted to say as far as play draw is in the esper midrange mirror because this is one that we kind of alluded to or not the mirror but just like esper in general midrange is that you know on the play it's oftentimes right to just play your hero of precinct one on turn two Right, but if you're on the draw and you have thought erasure, you might very well be better off playing thought erasure onto even if you have hero in hand, because of the way that you have to play in regards to the curve. Yeah, well, also and that, that. Sorry, continue. No, go ahead. I was going to say, well, th- like think about the other things we said so far in the podcast, right? It's like, well, now if you know the turns that matter, you can make that decision so much more easily, right? For example, like let's say you look at your hand, you're like, man, 
my hand's all about sticking a hero precinct one and then protecting it with these counter spells. And I had this one weird thought eraser, right? With this ca- counter spells and kill spells. And you're like playing against another Teferi Time Reveler deck. You might want to play your thought eraser on two, even though your hand's kind of telling you play hero precinct one first. Because if they stick the Teferi, you're like, oh no, my hand does nothing. I have all these dead cards. So. Yeah, yeah but that's just mm-hmm. definitely, definitely a play pattern, I think, that can they make a big difference whether or not you're on the play or the draw. And especially, you know, often you'll have the matchup information from, from what's ever happened in game one. Yeah, I think the, the next thing that I would want to talk about is, like, kind of how to maximize medium cards. You know, a really good example of this, I think, for me, recently has been Crawl Hard Pruner. Like, there are just matches where that card is just kind of medium. And knowing how to use the card in a given matchup is really important. So a good example of this is knowing that I can use my Crawl Harpooners to double to double spell with my with my uh, with my Chain Whirlers to get rid of Phoenixes against Mono Red after I board. You know, understanding like this card is not good in this matchup. I don't have better cards, so how can I use this card? Knowing that it's a big attacker into Mono Red once you're starting to close out the game, stuff like that. And you know, I think that that comes up with you know all kinds of cards i just oh go ahead i was gonna say i can think of another one if you want to give yeah go go for it so it actually happened to me on saturday when i was grinding arena is that i was playing against esper control and i thought eraser my opponent and i had a hero precinct one to play it was a turn three thought eraser and i uh, took some card and i knew that they had some spot removal but it was turn four like a vrasic attempt i think i took like a kaius wrath or something and i had i scried or surveilled a tyrant score and i started put in the yard and i was like oh wait the only creature i have right now is a hero precinct one in my hand I can use this as a way to counter their Vrasis Contempt. Or if they draw another Kaius Wrath, I'll be able to protect my hero. So I actually kept it on top, and then later they went turn four, like, you know, end of turn trying Vrasis Contempt it, and I saved my hero by bouncing it to my hand, and then got I was able to deploy it. Yeah, but yeah, and, and got a 1-1, one, one, right? So I, like, countered their spell, and, but and traditionally, right, you look at Tyrant Scorn, and you're like, this is for creature decks or whatever, yeah. bend that, I'm playing as a control deck. But it's like, oh, no, wait, this part of the buffalo is good here in this context. Or if I had like a Thief of Sandy in hand, I might not have used it. You've used the Buffalo reference on this podcast every single episode so far. I, uh, I blame myself. What can I say? I like to use every part of the Buffalo when it comes to the reference. Well, <laughs> I, I have a joke in my stand-up set that's about that, that Mason saw right before we started watching CC, started recording CC. He came and saw me do it. And then he said every part of the Buffalo every single week since that. So... I'm sorry, everyone. <laughs> I like to use it for max value. Can I say? <laughs> but I appreciate the reference. Trey, um, uh, do you want to move on to who's the beatdown? I figured if we were going to mention who's the beatdown, the uh, the MTG down on the podcast should at least talk about what that is. No, this is particularly uh, something that comes up with mid range decks, right? Like because you have the ability to to shift your responsibility and what your role is depending on what it is that's going on. And is establishing who the beatdown is, is whether or not you need to be trying to focus on killing your opponent or whether or not you need to be trying to focus on extending the game and making it go long. And this is not something that this is something that's often you can establish as to what your role is going to be in a matchup. And it's also something that you can pivot as to what your role should be in a game that you can start off where your goal is to extend. And it's like, okay, now it's time to turn the corner and we're supposed to kill. Right. And so that it has two roles and two phases. One is like establishing the matchup, and then the other one is when it's time to shift shift in a game. Yeah, I, I put in here, you know, two things to after this because I think that they're relevant to deciding who's the beat down. The size of your creatures at what part of the curve they're on, and then the spell composition in your deck. The size of the creatures is a really interesting one because if I have three mana four fours and you have three mana three threes. You actually are the beatdown with the three threes. You, I'm not the beatdown with the four fours because the the longer the game goes, the more four fours I'm going to draw, the more three threes you're going to draw. So you have to close out the game because every time I draw a four four, it effectively kills your three three in play. That's like the simplest explanation I can give for like this. What's actually a pretty complex uh, topic uh, is the you know how how your creatures line up versus each other determines whether or not you need to be attacking before I can play my creatures. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. And it, it might initially seem counterintuitive to people, right? Because you're like, well, my creatures are bigger and my creatures are better, so I'm I'm going to beat down because of that. But it's like, no, the other person better be taking that role or they're going to lose pretty bad. Yeah. And, they don't have a choice but to attack you. So if you attack them, it actually opens up opportunities. Yeah. The, the Grixis mid-range deck is a deck that really 
puts this to the test all the time because it plays basically the only creatures that it plays are all like four mana, four power flyers. It doesn't really play other stuff. Sometimes you'll side in Thief of Sanity or something else, but for the most part, it's just that. So your goal in every game is like, just make the game go as long as possible so I can start playing four mana, four power flyers. And then it'll switch on like turn five or turn six where you're like, okay, now I just want to kill you as fast as possible so that you can't make things go past this point because you can hit, you know, two, three turns and kill them. And so you end up having to like play the control role until you can get a board presence and then switch and pivot to just trying to kill them as fast as possible. Yeah, I, I think that um, Mason, do you have any thoughts on this before I move on to spell composition? No, you're good. I think everything was covered. Yeah, I, I think spell composition is the other one that matters. Like a really good example of this is, you know, I think Vapor Snag get a good did a good job of like helping people understand what their role is what was in a matchup. Like whether or not they were using their vapor snacks defensively or offensively, which sounds weird, but trust me, if you've played with that deck, you know what I'm talking about. But, you know, understanding how my spells are supposed to be used in the matchup dictates who the beatdown is just as much as anything else. And it also helps you break down the matchup. If I'm getting the most value out of my spells every game, I'm probably favored. Spells are really powerful. And if my spells are doing the things that I want them to do all the time, I don't have dead spells, I don't have bad spells. One of the reasons that spells are so powerful is because sometimes they're not good. You know, where a creature is always a creature in play, a spell sometimes just isn't relevant in the thing that you're trying to do. And because of that, if your spells line up well against your opponent's deck across the board, you're just a significant favorite. Yeah, I think a, a good example of talking about like role identification in a matchup comes from something Mason and I tested a lot which was, is it Phoenix versus Amulet Titan in Modern? And that's generally considered by all accounts a very favorable matchup for Amulet Titan. It's like something that they wanted to play against and they were doing well against. And Mason thought that as well. And we were playtesting it and I was winning a lot of the games that we were playtesting. And we started talking about it afterwards and it's like, the only thing that I'm trying to do every turn is make sure you can't do whatever it is you want to do. Like my only role is disrupting what you're doing. I'm only trying to control that as much as possible and everything else is incidental. I don't care about accomplishing anything else but that. And structuring every turn and every point of the game in order to do that, because if you do what you do, I just die. And being able to understand that it looks like that's a situation where I would need to be the beat down, but it's really I needed to play a control role because otherwise I just lose the game. Mm-hmm. If I... Yeah, I, I think that I hope that this breaks down some like key things for listeners to be able to next time they're sitting down play testing with somebody. These are things to talk about before the match and they talk about during and after. You know, one of the things that you can do is if there's a key turn in a game, talk about it. You know, if there's if there is a play, you know, something that was different on the play that would have been different on the draw, talk about it. If there's, you know, a card that you know you don't think is very good, but you can use that part of the buffalo in that way, talk about it. I, I think that <laughs> It really does help, uh, and it really lets you identify areas for you to improve as a player. Uh, you can find me at Spencer Thinking H. You can find Mason at Mason E. Clark. You can find Trey at Trey MC. You can support the show on Patreon at patreon.com slash ccmtg. You can check out our sponsor at mtgoasis.com. You can follow the show on Twitter or like us on Facebook. Just search for Constructive Criticism. We'll be there for you. Thank you, everybody, so much for listening this week, and we'll see everybody next week.